Great, so I, I love coming out and uh, talking with, with folks here, and we're, we're all part of something that's very special that's happening. I think we all take it for granted when we talk about video, but video is extremely powerful. Uh, video shapes policies, video frames issues, videos gives filmmakers <coughs> voices. The, the amount of communication and the amount of empathy and the amount of things that we can generate with film and, and video online is truly changing the world and making it hopefully a much better place. And so where I, I kind of had an analogy to that before is something every year I like to do is go to Sundance out in Park City, Utah. How many people have been to the Sundance Film Festival? It's just really a magical experience. You get to see a lot of the content creators. Uh, about two thirds of the people that make their films there are the first time filmmakers. So using the tactics that we learned earlier with the three point lighting and the self made cameras, you know, they, they go out there and make films. And so one of the, one of the guys in this about 1993 time frame was Robert Rodriguez. So everybody probably knows or have heard of Robert Rodriguez from his big movies and Miramax and Spy Kids and all this kind of stuff down. But literally back then he was uh, a guy at Sundance who convinced his friends to do medical experiments to raise enough money to make his first film. So they did all the, like, you know, fill out, do you have these issues? Yeah, go take this test. And they gave him like 500 bucks. And he did $7,000 worth of that, and then plus some post-production from Paramount. And he created this little film, and he documents it in a book. And if anybody ever needs inspiration about uh, the startup world in San Francisco, I think it's very analogous. The same year that he went to Sundance and won an award for El Mariachi, his $7,000 film, Steven Spielberg was doing Jurassic Park, right? And so if anybody remembers Jurassic Park, it was one of the very first kind of blockbuster, summer blockbusters, stand, wait in line. I think we waited in line for several hours to see Jurassic Park. But at that point, as a filmmaker, it could have been pretty daunting to go, how the heck am I going to compete in this online, you know, in our analogy today, how the heck am I going to compete with YouTube? Or how the heck am I going to compete with Facebook video? Or how the heck am I going to make my stuff stand out? And El Mariachi is a great testament of, you know, this guy created all that buzz for that movie as he was going head to head against Jurassic Park that came out at the same time. And so, recommend reading this book. It's just a great read and he just, it's his diary from that year of how up until making that film and getting it out. And you can draw lots of uh, analogies. And so, what I wanted to talk about today is kind of what I call digital El Mariachi. And what it means is, all of the cool things that you see at the high end, all of the things that were aspirational to us, creating video, creating this big kind of high quality video, are now within the reach of pretty much everybody. The cost of all of this stuff has come so far down that we now have all the ability to move past what we've heard earlier in the earlier talk about broadcast, and everybody talking about NTSC and broadcast as a new quality. Moving to a point where I kind of said the highest level of filmmaking, the most premium asset, with theatrical, theatrical cinema workflows. And so today's talk, I want to kind of show on a budget that any of us could afford, how we could, can create kind of cinematic workflows. And the goal for me is, I'd like to have a world where we have all of our videos look great. All the videos are well done, they're, they're good, you know? And so I, I just don't think there's enough time anymore to look at crappy video. And so if we can get rid of all of that, and, and you know, maybe it, the content won't all be great, but at least if it's technically well done, that's a start, and then the world's a little bit better place. And so, I think there's three, three kind of things that are, that are coming together that are making something that's better than the parts, you know? So, one plus one equals three kind of thing, except here we have three things, so it's not a perfect analogy, but we have software, network, and hardware. And so over here, we talked a little bit about the hip cam earlier, but the, the motors and the, the folks in China are just got these awesome little products coming out that are called gimbals. And so something like three million drones were shipped last year. And all of the factories that make motors like DJI and stuff have now made these motors that are called brushless motors that are almost silent, have tons of torque, and allow you to make computer controlled tracking motions. And so software now enters the realm of a physical cameraman. And so at your kid's football game anymore, you don't have to have someone sitting there doing the camera like that. You can just have an app moving your gimbal around, controlling your camera. 
And this gives you perfect, a little dude in Russia, uh, have, here's a great project, look at Alex Moss, if you want to just have a hobby that's going to consume your life. Uh, he has this little board that you plug those motors into, and it has all of this cool air correction and everything, so you can get a camera that pans, tilts, and all three axes, and you can completely control it. Historically in Hollywood, if you wanted a gimbal or a crane or any of those high-end things, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. You now can create the same shots, the cinematographic shots with that product, and you can get one of those built if you want to be a DIY guy for under $500. And it's totally Bluetooth controlled, so people in this room that knew how to do some basic serial communications can actually write programs that can do all kinds of cool stuff. And so uh, if you see House of Cards, when they do all this cool kind of uh, panning and, and stop motion and all this kind of cool stuff that kind of sets the tone for House of Cards when they open the shows, he actually uses these little gimbals with some software that this guy in Russia built. So you, know, you get on eBay, you talk to a manufacturer guy in China, a developer in Russia, some guys around. It's just kind of fun. It it's, it's almost becomes a hobby. The next piece that's really cool is what's happening with cameras. And so it used to be that if you wanted a Pentax camera with film and lenses, you're looking at you know, close to a million dollars by the time you got your whole kit put together to do truly cinematographic work. Um, Age of Ultron, a bunch of the big movies that are coming out either last summer or next summer, were shot on this camera that can be had for $900. And the glass on this camera, which is called a micro third Ford's lens, um, are pretty relatively easy to buy. And, and they're, you know, you can still spend a few thousand dollars on a lens. You know, photography is an expensive hobby. But you can get some great prime lenses for not a lot of money. And again, that drone phenomenon, people are putting better and better cameras on the front of those drones. So that price point for a 4K camera with actual cinemagraphic lenses has gone from what could have been a million dollars 10 years ago to now to under three grand. And so you got your gimbal, you got your digital cinema camera, and hopefully our next piece we're going to talk about is how you put that all together in a digital workflow. Because this camera uses standard SD cards. And so what SD cards are is uh, they basically just clip into the camera. You can go to, you know, CVS now sells SD cards. Obviously, for professional production work, you want very fast SD cards. And when you want to do professional work, kind of what I'm talking about is you want to have file formats. When you hear, have you heard of ProRes and ProRes 444, which basically you want as much of that data that's hitting the sensor in that camera to be recorded to your little SD card. You don't want to add a lot of compression. And so the difference between some of the consumer cameras that you can buy in the store and what they call a cinema camera, you want to check and say, does that camera do ProRes 444, which is called ProRes HE sometimes, is also high, high quality, versus L there's like low quality ProRes, high quality ProRes. High quality ProRes basically means that all of the color data is there, basically all of the data is there. Um, and then there's also, you'll hear Cinema Raw. And Cinema Raw basically means there's no compression whatsoever. Just get ready to buy lots of SD cards. <laughs> and then the next piece, and I'll get into this in our talk a little bit, is this is a box that we use. You might be familiar with anybody play video games, Steam, right? This is a box that you can actually buy for $200 at Walmart with a coupon. So when we were trying to figure out how to take the cards out of this guy, to put it this guy, to do a whole end-to-end -end workflow that I'll show you, the GPU NVIDIA servers, when you put all the GPU cards in and everything else, it's about an $8,000 build to build a box like that, which is not terrible. It's amazing performance, you know, and Amazon, I think, just bought Elemental for half a billion dollars. So there's a market for high-end GPU servers. But we were finding with a lot of our uh, cinema craft, you know, cinematographers and things, they didn't really want to have an $8,000 box on set, but they also wanted to take these cards out and get them into a workflow. And so we took that steam engine with USB 3, put card readers on the back, and now that allows you to take all of those files off your camera, put them in that, and now make it network addressable. And so this has a terabyte of storage, all of that in there, and it, USB 3 is about five and a half gigabits per second of data transfer you can get on that card reader. So you can get all of those files off in a few seconds and now have them start going into an automated workflow. And it's a 
you know, if you get the coupon, you know the secret code at Walmart, $200 box, right? <laughs> so it's a little bit of a, a hack here, but it's a hack that's not compromising on quality. It's a hack that, that's giving you everything that the highest level of professionals in our industry are doing for less than a few thousand dollars. And so to me, that's, that's really democratizing and that's really exciting. So the next thing that's exciting to me is the collective consciousness of this room, these vents like this, this is all getting recorded. There's some you know, next wave guy out there, gal, that's going to hear some of these talks today and it's gonna inspire them to do something. So there's a feedback loop that kind of I call the collective consciousness of the internet where all this data is now getting recorded. And while I think it's very important, the point I wanna make with this slide is if on that previous slide, when you're taking that card out of the camera and you're putting it in my box, I'm keeping all the metadata that you shot. I'm keeping what lens you used, what, you know, what time of day, your geolocation, all that extra metadata, and I'm doing it in such a way that's automated. I'm not having human intervention that's gonna mess up all the metadata or do it sometimes or not do it other times. We're always gonna keep it in a perfect chain of command. And what's really cool is, who wouldn't want this for their holiday photo this year? Get the family out in front of this. And you may not have the photography skills to take that picture. But I can go on to Flickr, search where I'm going on vacation. I'm gonna to go to the Grand Canyon. Tells me at what time this picture was taken, exactly what location it was taken, with what lens, what f-stop, and that's like you know, technical terms of uh, what, you know, what settings you dial in on your camera. And you too could have this beautiful picture, right? And so why I say that is, is if you're scouting locations for a movie or you're going to do a shoot, you can go on to something like Flickr or YouTube or whatnot and find exactly somebody else who's dialed in all the settings for you and you can pick up and improve from there. So you don't have to go back to hello world for every creative shot. You can use the thousands of cinematographers, the thousands of creative minds that have come before you and get you to a point and then take that point just a little bit further yourself and contribute that data back into the collective consciousness. So it pushes the creative community entirely forward. And that's why I think metadata is so important in that chain of command of pulling that all the way through from the camera all the way to the destination site. In this case, it was Flickr. And so over here, we have the back of a Canon camera. So this is a DMARC camera. It's a very popular camera that a lot of commercials and things are shot on. So they'll hear the term DSLR. And what you're seeing here is they're shooting what's called a raw format. And what RAW does is it, it just captures the video at its full, you know, what the pixels that hit the lens, that hit the sensor, hit the disc. And what's cool about this is this line down here represents, here's your sensor on the camera. This is you have the full data. Historically, when we thought about web video, this is what we would give the consumer. We threw away all of this. And this was what was considered good quality for the web. But advances in screen technologies, retina displays, move what we give the consumers forward. And what you're seeing now with guys like Vizio, and you're gonna hear some awesome talks later, so I won't get into the details, but uh, UHD, you know, ultra high def, high dynamic range, it's moving these lines forward and forward to the point at some point in the near distant future, you're gonna be giving consumers something that's this close to that cinematographic coming off the lens type experience. And so what people do today is they go from this camera to production workflow. And what I'm showing up here is again, another huge innovation from Blackmagic Design and Adobe and others. Back in the day, a few 10 years ago, when you wanted to do what was called coloring, they call it grading. Basically, when we talked about the Earlier in the talk, I can't believe how well this, some of these presentations are kind of coming together. We talked about the blues and the greens and the colors not quite being right. Software can correct all that. Since we're in a digital world, we can go back in and with the power of magic pixels, change the coloring of that and get that perfect advertising poppy look. And that's how high dynamic range content and other things are coming into existence. Is they're taking that photo that's coming off those cameras and they're adding effects, coloring, to make it really pop and create that huge color palette that makes everything look really great. 
And so that whole process there from camera to coloring and out is what I kind of call the cinematograph workflow. And so you don't want to just shoot your picture and put it straight out. You want to shoot your picture, color it, give it that mood, that tone, that just, mm, that polish. Just like you wouldn't want to have crackly audio. You'd want to put your audio through an EQ. All of those little things, that cinematographic workflow, that I think are really important. And so this is kind of where I think video should go, is people are taking it through this very professional process. And the good news, this software now from Blackmagic Design, if you own one of their products, is free, the light version. I mean, it's a $250,000 software package just a few years ago. Free. It's incredible, right? Um, and then, you know, Adobe Creative Suite, I, it's amazing. $50 or something a month. And if you're a student, even less. You now have access to all of these tools from Adobe as well to create this amazing workflow. And so when we talk about these amazing workflows, I'll jump back a little bit between <coughs> forward and back, right? So as you saw some announcements last week, us in the industry, we saw a couple, I thought, huge significant announcements that just kind of throw everybody's workflow up into a jumble. So the first one was Amazon Prime and Amazon came out with the Fire. And they said, yeah, we're going to support 4K, high dynamic range. Plug it in, bro, right? And Nobody in the studio system, nobody else, has all their movies stored in a format that's ready to go. So, so going back to that previous slide when you talked about the data coming down, most mezzanine formats are somewhere right about in that middle. And so everybody's going, great, got to go back to film again, or hopefully we got that in the can somewhere. So people are digging around in caves in Kentucky somewhere right now trying to figure out how they're going to get ready for the holidays and have all their catalog ready for these um, video technologies that are actually superior to when they were shown in the cinema many times. And so I think it's creating a lot of angst. The other big announcement was from Apple. Apple said, hey, you know what, sports, you look awesome in 60 frames per second. We don't really want your 30 frames per second content for sports anymore. Just update all your encoders and everything else. We're going to 60 frames. And you get clients calling in. Does that affect anything? Yeah, it kind of doubles everything, really, you know? <laughs> Oh, but it will still work with all the 30 frames per second players, right? No. <laughs> You're going to do two streams, bro. So let's just double that up, right? So it's good for our business. We love it, right? But <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, and again, what happened in the, kind of the enterprise IT, where the consumers kind of went out and went beyond what the PC, so the people coming in to work with their iPhone going, yeah, my, this is faster than my desk computer. I'm going to kind of just do my job over here on my phone. It's kind of happening now where the consumers are ahead of DirecTV, Comcast. They're like, there's just always been, well, oh, the broadcasters aren't going to be quite ready, so we have a lot of time to figure the video out. The consumers went, hey, I ordered it on Amazon Prime. It's getting here in two days, man. Where's my content, right? So it's, it's going fast. It's going fast. And the consumers are going to lead. It's not bottlenecked by an intermediary broadcaster. And so 60 frames per second, ultra high definition, 8-bit, 10-bit, 12-bit, all of that is really just massive complexity. And you start thinking of all the permutations and all the edge cases. Multiply that by all the devices that you have to QI, QC. Thinking about all the different permutations of that, it kind of gives a lot of people a complexity mind freeze, where they kind of go, I kind of just miss the good old days of where, you know, we'd throw a quick time movie up and it would just kind of play sometimes. That, you know, that was acceptable. Um, it's, it's a very big, very gnarly problem. And so how I like to solve big, complex problems is to create a process. And so you have the creative process, and the creative process and the operational process often don't marry. And so the creative people sometimes just like to go and be creative. But to get something as complicated as I'm going to take these assets I'm producing here and get them to this wide of something over here, you have to have a process. And I call that a chain of command. And so the chain of command to support our world means you never lose control 
of your digital file. So again, there's that SD chip we keep talking about. The second that comes out of the camera and goes into the Brevity box, our product, or whoever you decide to use there, you now are in a digital workflow. And you do not leave that digital workflow. You do not take that digital workflow and put it on a hard drive in the front seat and drive it around Burbank. You keep that in a networked process where you have asset control, right? And that asset control, you're checking it. Did the person shoot in 24P or 24? On the Blackmagic camera, there's two settings that both say 24. One, your audio is going to be in sync and your movie is going to be awesome. The other one, not so much, right? But you don't know that because you have to have a chain of command. You have to have knowing what your assets coming in are going to be. Are they going to be in the right bit rate? What if your camera person has everything just shooting on an 8-bit and you're going, I'm doing high dynamic range and all those other things, you don't have enough color, enough data to get to that point. So you have to have chain of command starting there. Then you're going to have this massive complexity of post-production and production. And oftentimes in our world, we've thought of two things where, hey, I'm in the distribution side. Here's an FTP site. Send me your files. We're good, bro. It gets a lot more complicated than that now. So once it comes out of these production formats, again, that sliver coming down here of data, we got to make sure that we don't have some knucklehead all of a sudden drop out a bunch of video quality or just make a transcode. You know, I saw people going, oh, I'm reading the Netflix spec to submit IMF files. I'll just take this H.264 file I have and up-res it into an, OF, you know, into an MXF file. Yeah, dude, not the point, not the point, you know? We want all that quality. They, they're, that quality, they're asking for it for a reason. They want all their movies to have the signature look to it. They want it to all look great. If you're just up old crappy content, that's not good enough anymore. So that whole production facility has to make sure that you're producing content that's at that highest res, that highest point of source that you have. And then going out to all these various different devices. And so that could be, you know, laptops, screens, Roku's, you know, all kinds of cool stuff, right? But you want to have all the way end to end, you want to control that experience and that chain of command. So I'm going to show here just a quick, this has been edited for time and content, as they say in the biz. Um, but I want to kind of just show an example here of how this might look very quickly. So here's a dashboard. We have a project called Grading. In this grading project, we're going to have it go out to our edit bay and drop off the files after they arrive from the camera. We've ingested some files from the camera. We now go into our bin in Adobe Premiere. There's our file that we just shot. It's now in our timeline. We notice that that color is way off. It's not very exciting. It's kind of washed out. So let's take it into our grading process. So we're going to open up speed grade. Adobe makes this ridiculously easy. You can try some different settings there. Ah, much better. Much, much better. Great. Boom. Back into the distribution queue. So we're done with our post-production process. <laughs> Boom. Connects. Boom. It's now transcoded for distribution. I'm playing it back in my JW player. Like that, right? So as you saw there, I coordinated my disk, my storage, my compute, along with my workflow, along with my creative process, along with my production physical process of those things. And I had it all laid out in a set of tiles, kind of Monopoly card workflows, that I could go from end to end. And I know now that I have a file that's usable, I now have it tracked, I have an asset, I have both my distribution assets, and if I need anything back at the source, I have all those files too. So it gives me a nice way to manage. And do I care if those files are on set, or in Amazon Cloud, or in my own data center, or back in my edit bay? Not really. They're addressable through the system. And they're going to be in all of those locations at different times during the process. And so in wrapping up here, thinking about all these things at kind of high levels, right? You want to think about where all my source video is coming from. Where are all my different resolutions that I'm going to be dealing with? What are my frame rates, my compression schemes, my file containers, all my metadata, data tracks? And I'm going to think about where my locations and networks are for all that coming in. And then I'm going to have to have status. I want you know, dashboards in real time. And where is it? Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. Velocity, 
Am I dealing with YouTube velocity or am I dealing with one movie a week? You know, what, what's that look like? How fast do I need this? If I'm in a news organization, stories have money and time to them. And then I'm going to be doing my deliveries to all my partners. And so do my APIs from that system dynamically deliver it right into Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and whatnot? Absolutely should. You don't want to have to have a physical process where you're like, okay, and now we put a stamp on a hard drive. You know, that, that just needs to go away badly. And so those are the keys to success. You want to kind of think about that operational cue all the way up front and enforce it, but make it super easy for everybody to enforce. Pick up from a list, right? You want to maintain all of this metadata, data, derivatives, and policy. You have to have that and maintain it through the whole process or it turns into scrambled eggs. And then you want to force process and automation to avoid costly mistakes. Again, having the wrong frame rate or throwing away a key shot all creates thousands of dollars on a movie production set and, and losses. And then you're going to need a massive amount of disk, network, and compute. And thank goodness for Google and Amazon and, and all of these guys that are just filling up data centers for us. So we can use all of that as, as creative artists. And so to summarize, just to wrap it all kind of up and hopefully put it in a nice, neat little bow, cinema workflows look awesome. I think we should all do them. Um, just makes it much better. Uh, we'll have debates here, I'm sure, about some of us. We have, is any form of compression OK? Is a little bit OK? So we can have compression. We can have lossless compression. We can have visually lossless compression. And then obviously, you go too far, it looks screwed up, right? And those are kind of the general settings of compression. So we can, we can pick out which ones we think are the, the right ones. Um, some of us are billion dollar well-funded companies. Others are making payroll out of our lemonade stands. It's all okay, right? We all have different levels of money, time, and resources. That's no excuse for not making good stuff. So regardless of where you're at in terms of your resources, um, that's, you know, you're gonna do something awesome. And these constraints, Robert Rodriguez, you know, Metallica's best album was done when they were all living on the floor on Sunset Strip, right? Just because you have billions of dollars and resources and other thing doesn't mean you can't make crap, right? The, the people oftentimes that have the least amount of resources make the best stuff. And so I hope that that happens here as well. And we don't really have time to wait and plan it out. So you kind of have to jump in and build a plane in the air because the consumers and everybody else is kind of ready for it now, today. It's not something that's in the future. This isn't a 2020 kind of let's get ready for it, you know? Kickoff is in about a half hour. Let's, let's get the team on the field. All right, guys, thank you. <laughs>